change can be a pretty intimidating thing. And in light of what's going on with COVID-19, we're seeing dramatic change and disruption at multiple levels. Humans are a unique species in that we tend to avoid uncertainty. And we don't like uncertainty because cognitively our brains can't handle the complexity of uncertainty, especially at a global level with so much being interconnected. So we tend to make assumptions or make strategies that help us simplify the world. Think of the way that Newtonian science has helped us dismantle the complexity of the natural world into smaller chunks, into disciplines, study things in isolation and allowed us to understand that thing and then even re-engineer it to make it suit our needs. So humans have this innate desire to simplify the complex, which makes times like now so interesting to see how people respond. But I take solace in looking to nature. That's what biomimicry is all about, is looking to design ideas from the natural world. And nature can teach us a lot about change. So there's something called the adaptive cycle. It's a four box model that describes ecological evolution and the way that nature maintains resilience through change. So in the front loop, there's two stages, exploitation and conservation. In exploitation, you can imagine after a disturbance like a forest fire or a, a pest invades uh, an ecosystem, there's this new opportunity that's emerged. And in exploitation, things called our species come in and take over. They're the pioneers, the entrepreneurs, and the innovators that come in and exploit these new resources and opportunities. But they're doing a really important service in that they're helping to dissipate any gradients, use up any resources, um, and stabilize that ecosystem. They're also providing the biomass for larger species to come in and grow because these are species usually have shallow roots, they have lots of progeny, they have lots of seeds, and they live and die pretty quickly to create that biomass. So through ecological succession, through lots of growth and renewal, release and dying, larger species will start to emerge. And these larger species are called K species. And they enter into what's called a state of conservation. It's a state of conservation because the resources that were once readily available are now stored in the trunks of these larger species. And it's conservation because it's a much more complex system and it's much harder to adapt in terms of its speed of adapt and its ability to adapt as the environment around it changes. So you can think of a tree, for example, it's harder for that tree to make large scale adaptations if the environment changes. So in the back loop, what nature does is it has this technique of releasing to allow reorganization. It releases at multiple scales, and that release could be a tree falling, a branch breaking off of a tree, or a complete forest fire. And that allows the nutrients that were once stored in that organism to go back into the system and allow new species to exploit that. And these species may be more appropriate or attuned to the environment. For example, imagine a willow tree near a river. If that river were to dry up, that willow, which is a water-loving species, will eventually die. And all of those stored nutrients go back into the system, and some new organism will exploit those in our species, which may be more appropriate to that condition. It may be more drought-resistant. This release, like I said, happens at multiple scales, and that's called a panarchy. A panarchy describes the way that systems are embedded in systems, and at each level, those systems are releasing and reorganizing. So a tree, for example, in a forest may fall down. And that disruption allows that larger ecosystem to make small adaptations to the environment. But if you isolate the tree and look at just the tree, perhaps a branch falls off. Or, for example, the leaves falling every year, which allows that release and reorganization. And the leaves that come in the next spring might be a different shape, a different color, because they're using information from their environment to make small scale changes. And if you think of a complex ecosystem, there are all of these organisms that are autonomously changing and using information from its environment to make the changes necessary to survive. What we understand about ecosystems is that they strive to be the most diverse and complex possible because that means it's more resilient to changes. So if a pest comes in, it won't wipe out um, a monoculture because there's so much diversity. 
that's what keeps an ecosystem resilient, is that constant release and reorganization and that cooperative competition, you know, inciting competition and innovation, but at the same time supporting each other through resource sharing and information. What's unique about humans is that we have an ability to stay in conservation. We can do this through our use of stored energy and materials. So unlike any other species on the planet, we can harness stored energy in things like fire to re-engineer our environments and to create materials that are robust and that resist the natural environment. You can see this in many systems that we use energy and material to keep a system in conservation. The problem with that though is that if you keep a system in conservation for too long, a, it takes a lot of energy to maintain that system, but B, it means that there's a greater um, potential for a large scale release and reorganization. It doesn't have that panarchy release and reorganization. So what we're seeing today with the COVID-19 is an example of a massive disruption where our whole panarchy is being influenced. But if you go back to 2008 during that economic recession, we saw a release at a smaller scale. It was still quite significant but you could also see how we responded to that release in that we put lots of energy and resources and money into trying to conserve existing systems that may have been trying to release and reorganize. Specifically, think of the car industry. 100 years ago, um, cars looked like this. They were invented by these entrepreneurs, pioneer species, and they evolved into a large ecosystem where we have a lot of diverse um, automobile manufacturers. Um, and that's what a lot of our system is built around, is built around the automobile. In 2008, we saw a major collapse in that industry, but we injected a lot of energy to keep it the same because it makes a lot of sense because we have um, people's livelihoods. A lot of people worked um, and were employed by those industries. So we want to conserve that system. Well, what's interesting is that now we're seeing a natural release in that ecosystem, the way that Tesla is disrupting that system. And now the whole automobile industry is reorganizing to catch up with the electric car movement. Another example of natural releases is you could think of Uber and Airbnb, which after 2008, they found opportunities. I'll call them wasted opportunities in terms of underused cars and underused homes. And they created an app that exploited those and allowed a new ecosystem to evolve. So those R species inspired a new way of thinking about hospitality and transportation. What I'm saying in all of this is that humans have a unique way of conserving systems, but release is natural and it's inevitable. The more you try to conserve systems, the more you're at risk of being out of touch and the more you're at risk of wasting or using a lot of energy and potentially having a larger scale collapse. But what we can learn through the adaptive cycle is that in states of release and reorganization, we have the ability to plant seeds for the next succession. Nobody knows where that succession is going to go. The system is too complex. So we cannot fully understand and grasp what's going to happen after COVID-19, for example. We don't know how it's going to all settle out. What we do know is that we can start to plant seeds for the world that we want to live in, create the systems, the forms, the processes that work for the most people, for the most species, for the most diversity, the same way that nature does it. You're either going to be disrupted because change is inevitable, or you're going to be a disruptor. You're actually going to take part in the disruption and create those small scale releases and reorganizations. This is a key to human resilience and to company, corporate, and community resilience. It's that ability to release at small scales, to allow reorganization, so that your system is constantly in tune with its environment or its clients, and it's adapting and evolving and maintaining resilience.